One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so I think I'm going. Let's make sure that the thing works. Okay, it does. All right, so the good news is I figured out that there was a problem. Uh, the bad news is that you missed about 20 minutes of me talking. So I'm going to start this uh, feed all over again, uh, including for the third time today, typing in all of the different uh, things. So we're going to do question 3 and 17 and 47 and 51 and then practice assignment question 29 and 42 and 46 and 49 and 53 practice final okay so uh, the deal here is that we're going to um, we're going to go through some just basic assignment questions, the type we're going to see on this assignment. Um, Jake has also uploaded a practice assignment onto Connect. It's not worth any marks. Do it. Don't do it. Doesn't matter. Even if you do it and get perfect grades on it, uh, it still won't affect your overall grade. Um, it's listed as something like a practice assignment. Um, just so you can get some more, uh, some more experience doing these types of questions, uh, you know, in the mastering physics section setting to get you up to speed. Um, so the first third of our, our thing, we're going to go through uh, basic uh, questions, just like this week's assignment that is due. And then the second half, we're going to do a practice assignment questions. We'll literally do the questions out of the book that you're supposed to do. So you can see me walk through those. Um, and then after that, I'll do the, uh, the final exam from last year, at least to the best of my abilities, um, which has been uploaded to Connect. So if you go to Connect, you can download uh, the thing on Connect. All right, let's go. I've got to keep, I'm going to keep an eye on the live chat um, in case anybody has anything to say. But I guess, look, you get to see all the stuff you missed. I guess you only missed a page of it. I guess it took me a lot to get up and going. All right, so without further ado, let's get this show on the, oh, son of a bun. Hold on. Get in, come on, just once. All right, and so my pen works now. How about this thing? This thing going? Hey, good. Hello. All right, you can see it, and now various other things are opening on my computer. All right. So, um, you can see this. Let's see if, uh, the, um, yes, okay, you can see that too. All right, so let's start uh, with question. Um, uh, question, which one? Three. Page 201, question three. Question three goes like this. When one race car passes another during a race, the passing car usually tries to pass on the inner lane of the curve of the track. Why? Uh, the answer is actually pretty fun. Think about a race. You've got a race car. There's cars on a track. All right, and each of those cars has some velocity, phi, v. Okay, so the fun thing about a race is that it's not actually about how fast you're traveling. That's not the thing you measure in a race, in a car race. Um, you do in a drag race, but not a car race around a circle, because the deal is in these round tracks, they don't actually care how fast you go, or how far you go. What they care about is your angular position, okay? So it might say, hey, you need to go around the track four times. That corresponds to uh, four times two pi. Angular position. You see what I'm saying? Okay. So there's two ways to get a big angular velocity. 
Uh, one of them is to move quickly. Uh, but angular velocity is v over r. If you have a smaller value of r, closer in, you'll have a faster angular velocity. So you can have two cars like these two here traveling with the same speed, but the one closer to the center is going to have a bigger angular velocity. Another way to explain this is to go, oh, well, if each of these travels in a circle, one of them will travel along this circle, one of them will travel along this circle, <laughs> fine. Um, the one with a smaller circle has a, has a smaller circumference, uh, and so even if it's traveling the same speed, it will go around the circle in a shorter amount of time. So it'll win the race. See what I'm saying? Okay, that's why you want to pass on the inside. All right, question 17. A gymnast backflip is considered more difficult to do in the layout, straight body position, than in the tucked position. Why? All right, so let's think about a backflip. You gotta use your backflipper. Maybe they're bending their knees at first. <clears throat> and then they, here's their center of mass. They're gonna jump, do a backflip, and then land, hopefully, on their feet. Okay. So that's what their center of mass does. The center of mass isn't going to do a backflip because it's, it's just going to move. Okay, but here's the fun part. Um, you're only in the air a short amount of time. Okay. And what that means is, regardless of the method you use to do a backflip, there's a minimum angular velocity you need to have on average as you backflip, which is you need the angular velocity to get you around the circle to rotate once in the amount of time you're in the air. Uh, otherwise put, uh, one of these things this means is that uh, the bigger, the higher you can jump, the more time you're going to spend in the air, uh, the less, the less large your uh, your angular velocity needs to be. Alternatively put, if you have tiny little weak legs and you can only be in there a very short time, uh, you need quite a big angular velocity. But this isn't a question about angular velocity. This is a question about different positions. So uh, one of these positions looks like this, where you're doing a vac flip, and you're looking like this. and you're rotating around the center in that position. And the other possibility is when you're tucked. So here's a person tucked. That means that they pulled their knees up to them and they're little. Okay, so both these positions might have the same angular velocity. You wanna go around one time in the time you're in the air. Which one of them requires more energy? Uh, the kinetic energy, if you're moving and if you're rotating, is one half i omega squared. Okay, so both of them have the same angular velocity. Um, what about i? I is the moment of inertia. It's the, uh, it's the rotational inertia, sometimes it's called. And it has to do with mass distributions. Essentially, we're just, we're just taking an object. It's made out of little chunks of mass. And these, each of these chunks is going to be some radius away from the middle. And we're just going to add them up, m r squared, for each of the different parts. Um, now. In this case, these two people have the same mass because it's the same person. Um, but in this one here, the mass is all close to the center of mass. It's close to the center. In this case, all the mass is, well, I mean, it's distributed. Some of the mass out here is much farther away from the middle. Why does that matter? It matters in this formula, r squared. That means that if something is far away from the middle, it's going to have a huge increase on the moment of inertia. What does that mean? That means that the moment of inertia in this, in this position, 
uh, what's it, what's what's it called? It's called um, layout. Is going to be way bigger than the moment of inertia in the tuck position. What does that have to do with anything? Well, that means that the kinetic energy. Keep in mind that they both have the same angular velocity. They both go around the same amount of time. The kinetic energy in the layout position, because I is larger, has to be way bigger to rotate, to do a successful backflip than in tuck position. In other words, uh, you don't have to work as hard to get, to, to get the appropriate amount of angular velocity if you're in the tuck position. If you're in layout position, you need a ton of energy to go around once in that amount of time. Oh, hey, look, somebody mentioned something on the live chat. Let's go see. Hey, Mang, can you please tell Jake to go a little easy on us for the exam? I'd appreciate that. Thanks. Um, what, I, is it, you should be afraid of me, not Jake. Okay, so uh, his next question is, also, I have a wheel question. While solving question J-Bob, I guess, I guess that means Jake. Does Jake have a, like, a really friendly relationship with his class? I don't know. I have a wheel question. While solving the question, J. Bob mentioned that there is no motion between the bottom wheel and the surface. Can you ex please explain that? Okay. Um, so I just finished answering this question. I want to answer the, uh, the live chat question. The live chat question is uh, one about rolling without slipping. Okay. Um, we're going to see this when we do the, the practice exam. It's, there's a question in it about it. But, I mean, here's the thing. I want you to imagine a, a, a wheel. A wheel has a center of mass. I guess, uh, C-O-M. But it also has a, you know, a, a size. Um, so the deal is that what do wheels do? They turn. So um, as the wheel, the wheel moves forward, the center of mass has a velocity. But in addition to that, the wheel has an angular velocity. It has both a center of mass motion and an angular velocity, OK? So that's kind of a complicated, weird thing. I want you to imagine that you're on a bicycle. Here's you on your bike. What do bikes look like? They look like that, right? OK. So uh, you're on your bike, and you're all moving forward. The bikes wheel has the same velocity as you do. It's not surprising the bike isn't running away from you. It's just turning in front of you. <clears throat> what does the wheel look like to you? How does it move? Um, so the relative velocity of the wheel is essentially uh, relative to relative to me is that it's the center of mass is stationary. And so uh, the different parts of the wheel will be moving with different velocities. The edge of the wheel will be moving with some velocity like that. How big is, these, is this velocity? Well, it's the radius. And v is equal to omega r. V is equal to omega r, right? <coughs> OK, so now for the fun part. Um, <clears throat> the fun part is, as it rolls, how does it relate to the ground? Um, so this is the this so these these velocity vectors they're velocity vectors relative to me. Uh, you know, so I look at the wheel in front of me and I go, oh, the top of the tire is moving that way, the bottom of the tire is moving that way. V. Uh, Omega r, v, omega r. You dig? V, c, o, m is equal to 0. These are, like I said, these are relative velocities. Um, so then, uh, 
to somebody who's just standing still outside here, we'll call this person Observer A, they're watching you ride your bicycle without a helmet. Put a helmet on. Okay. Um, strap it on. There you go. Now it's healthy. Um, so they're going to see a relative velocity picture um, just like just like we did. This is essentially the same mathematics as you, if you're talking about somebody who's walking on a train. Um, <clears throat> so remember, this person has the same velocity as the center of mass does. Okay, I'll call it V-bike. <clears throat> so relative to this person, um, it's going to see these velocity vectors differently. Omega r, omega r. This person sees the center of mass move this way, v bike. Okay. And so, um, <clears throat> the this person's going to see the top part of it having an overall v bike an overall velocity these two vectors combined and the bottom part of the bike so the top part here bottom part here uh, v bike goes one way and vr goes another way um, so <clears throat> let's let's refresh this v bike okay so the top of the wheel ha relative to this person the top of the wheel has a big velocity. It's going to be omega r plus v bike. And the bottom one's going to have probably some kind of smaller velocity. V w r um, minus. Wait, no, I did that wrong. Minus w r, because the velocity is going to the left, plus v bike. OK, so that's just vector addition. OK, now's the fun part. So that's the general picture of how to talk, use vectors to talk about how the different parts of the bike wheel are moving relative to this person. You just use relative velocity. Let's talk about what it feels like when uh, you have a bike wheel. OK, so here's the ground. Um, So what, what's it like if your bike wheel on the ground slips? Uh, you know what I mean? I mean, like, uh, sometimes you see people in cars peeling out. So uh, their tires are spinning faster than, uh, than the car is moving forward. You can do the same on a bike. In those cases, what's happening is the bottom part of the bike is moving faster What's happening in those cases is essentially the uh, the the part touching the ground is slipping, okay. Let me put it this way: there is a special case called rolling without slipping. Where the bike tire stays in place in contact with the ground. Um, I'm going to give you an example that, that might make this make a little bit more intuitive sense, but let's connect it to this thing. Um, rolling without slipping is when the, the velocity down of this part here is equal to zero. And what does that mean? That means omega r is equal to v bike. The wheel will still travel forward with v bike, and then the top part of the wheel is going to go forward twice as fast. 2v bike. Okay? It's just a relative velocity picture. Okay, so, so, um, hold on. Uh, 
Uh, right. I want you to think about like uh, bike bike tire tracks. So you know, you go, hey, I'm a cool person. Look at my cool eyebrows. I'm gonna ride my cool mountain bike. My mountain bike has a big studded tire. <clears throat> I'm gonna ride my mountain bike on the dirty road. Yeah, okay. So you ride your bike on the muddy road. And then you go back to look at the, at, at the tracks. The tracks are gonna look like this. You ever wonder about that? Like, I mean, the tire's moving, right? Why isn't it leaving a smear? And you know, if you do slip, you know, suppose it's really muddy and you start to slide, the track will end up looking like, like a big messy smear. Uh, why can you leave these nice tracks? The bike tire is moving after all. And the answer is because when you're rolling without slipping, uh, the bike tire, the part of the tire, because of relative velocity, the part of the tire in contact with the ground doesn't actually move. It goes up and down, presses down on this side and comes up on this side, um, but it doesn't shift laterally at this one point. Uh, so that's what rolling without slipping is, and it's essentially this condition. Uh, the neat thing about rolling without slipping is that we have a good relationship between the motion of the wheel and how fast it's spinning. If you want to move faster, you have to spin your tires faster. Does that make sense? Okay. So uh, that's rolling without slipping. We'll, we'll get back to it. I've got another, um, an online, another uh, question on the uh, live chat. This one goes, if you have two objects, one rolls and the other slides, both going down no friction, the object that slides will be faster because the object that rolls gains rotational kinetic energy. Can you explain this idea? Yeah, sure. Uh, so let's imagine we've got two things. This is, this is, we, my class hasn't covered this quite yet. Um, so you got your tire on one and you got a big ice cube on the other. Okay. And mu is equal to zero on this one and it ends up down at the bottom. Uh, mu is not equal to zero on this one. You need static friction. Static friction is what lets you roll without slipping. Uh, static friction is what holds your tire in place on the ground, uh, but don't worry about that. So, here's the idea. When this guy gets to the bottom, in both cases, yeah, I mean, sure, let's go, both have the same mass uh, and same change in height, h, h. In both cases, uh, they start with v is equal to zero, v is equal to zero. Um, in both cases, they start with uh, potential energy. So initially, uh, the gravitational potential energy is gonna be mass times gravity times h, gpe plus ke. In this case, mgh. They both have the same amount of energy and they both start out with no kinetic energy. Down at the bottom of the hill, GPE plus KE, um, there's no gravitational potential energy and there's only kinetic energy. Okay, which is great. It tells you uh, that both of these have the same amount of kinetic energy when they reach the bottom of the hill. Okay, so here's the fun thing. In this case, the object isn't rotating, which means that there's only one type of kinetic energy. One type, one half mv squared, okay? In this case though, to go from this position to this position, the object has to roll. So by the time they get to the bottom, uh, we know that it's rotating with some speed as well as moving forward. There is a relationship between these two if it's rolled without slipping, which is what we just talked about. But the idea here is that there's both. It's rotating and moving laterally. And that means there's two kinds of kinetic energy. That, I mean, it looks like that. That's just lateral motion. 
i omega squared. Uh, that's the moment of inertia. That's the angular velocity. Okay, so now we compare these. In both cases, both of these numbers add up to mgh, mgh, okay? In this case, we know that it has to rotate, and so this number is probably going to be bigger than zero. How big is it going to be? Depends on the wheel and the shape of the wheel and the mass distribution in the wheel and whether it rolled without slipping. But we know it's rolling a little bit, at least. And so this number here is going to be bigger than zero. This one gets all of its motion, its lateral velocity. All of this energy goes into lateral motion. In this case, in the, other, in the previous case, all this energy is split between these two types of motion. Only this one corresponds to translation. Only, only this one corresponds to it moving sideways. I mean, they both kind of do, but this guy's spinny. This guy's motion uh, along its own axis, whereas this one is uh, lateral motion. And so, as a result, um, this case is going to have less energy put into lateral motion because some of it has to go to rotating motion and so this one's going to travel slower than this one even though they have the same amount of energy uh, we'll see a question a little bit later like that all right if there aren't any more uh questions let's go back to the uh, assignment let's go question 47. Really? 47? Oh, I do 49 later. Okay. Uh, 47 goes like this. In figure P11.47, two identical pucks B and C, each inertia M, are connected with a rod of length L and a negligible inertia that's free to rotate about its center. Then puck A of inertia M over 2 comes in and hits B. After the collision in which no energy is dissipated, what are the rotational speed of the dumbbell and the velocity of A? This is fun. Um, this length all over two. Let's see. Okay. So, here's the fun part. Um, you're tempted to, to do this using um, kinetic energy and, uh, and uh, linear momentum, conservation of momentum and, and conservation of energy. And to be honest, that kind of works. Kind of works okay. But it's a lot more fun. And okay, so it, it kind of, let me, let me continue. Um, <clears throat> how's it going to work? Uh, this guy comes in and it exchanges energy with this one. This guy gets some energy that goes into it moving that way. Uh, this one, A, is also going to feel an impulse in that direction, and that means that this guy is also going to feel an impulse in that direction. It's slightly more complicated than that, though, this instantaneous collision, because as B moves, B is going to try to move. That means that C will also have to move. They're connected together. Um, so it's not quite as easy as it looks. Instead of linear uh, momentum and linear kinetic energy, though, we can do this question with... Um, with uh, angular velocity and angular momentum. What do you mean? Well, okay, let's 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 talk about it. I mean, there's momentum. Initial has to be the same as the final total momentum, right? And uh, the initial kinetic energy, rotational kinetic energy, has to equal the final kinetic energy. So let's, let's, let's just use this as a constraint and add it up. Uh, the reason this is difficult is because uh, it's easy enough to talk about this one in terms of 
having angular velocity and angular momentum. That part of the system is super easy. Oh heck, let's do it now. Um, this part here, uh, it's going to have a moment of inertia that's going to be um, uh, the mass. Each one has mass m and uh, radius l over 2 squared plus m l over 2 all squared. So this becomes m l over 2. So we know how much uh, inertia it has. And so it's uh, rod, the rod system, it's uh, angular uh, momentum is going to be m l over 2 angular velocity and its kinetic energy of the rod is going to be 1 half m l over 2 omega squared. And so we can use these terms to talk about the, the, the angular momentum and angular velocity contribution of this part of the system. Uh, there's another part of the system which is this guy, and that's kind of tricky to talk about. But it's not as tricky as you think, because we can imagine that this guy, all right, here, hold on. I'm going to, I'm going to draw the same picture, but I'm going to ignore uh, the rod. So here's where the center of the rod is, and A is up here. It comes in with velocity like that. Comes in with velocity, does it say what velocity it has? It says just VI. Okay, so it's going to be traveling down this way, which is fine and it, it's fun. Um, and describing it, in ch its motion in terms of lateral position is absolutely fine. But keep in mind, we can also talk about it having some angular position, eh? And then as it moves, it will also have an angular velocity. Um, Keep in mind, though, that its angular velocity is going to change in this case um, because it gets farther out or closer to the system. But don't, don't worry about that. Let's focus on when it hits B. It hits the B when it's at this position, L over 2. Okay. When it's right here, it hits B. Um, at this moment, this velocity corresponds to uh, an initial angular velocity of the system. Uh, Vi divided by L over 2, right? <coughs> and this thing has uh, a, a moment of inertia as well. It's going to be the mass of the disk, which is m over 2, uh, times L over 2 all squared. So that's ml over 8. So, here's the fun bit. Um, initially, uh, the, there's an angular velocity of the disk, which is um, 2 vi over l. Okay? And uh, there's a, the initial velocity of the rod, the angular velocity of the rod is 0, because it hasn't been bumped yet. <clears throat> Uh, so there's momentum. Uh, the angular momentum is going to be L disk plus um, L disk is equal to the speed times I. So that's going to be 2 VI over L times m l over 8 cancel cancel v i m over 4 uh, the angular momentum of the rod is going to be 0 because its angular velocity is 0 okay uh, the angular momentum of the uh, of the sorry I need to talk about the kinetic energy kinetic energy of the disk is going to be 1 half i omega squared. One half m l over eight four v i squared over l squared. Whoa, look at all the canceling. 
So that's uh, over four. Uh, yep. And then there's an L down here and an M V I squared. Why is that the kinetic energy? Am I doing things right? Hold on. <sighs> M over two, one half, VI squared. There should be another L somewhere here. Oh, 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 whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh. whoa, hold on, hold your horses. Uh, this one has a squared. That's what it is. Did I do the other one too? Squared. Squared. Um, squared. So then, how does that change things? This picks up a two, that picks up a two. L, cool. All right, so that cancels that out. Okay, which is exactly the kinetic energy we would ordinarily expect. The kinetic energy of the rod is equal to zero. Now the fun part, after the collision, Um, I'll write it omega of the disc and omega of the rod. Okay. So, uh, angular momentum is conserved. V I M over four times L mm -hmm. is equal to <clears throat> M L squared over eight omega disk plus see, ML squared omega wait um, rod and then <clears throat> uh, the energy is conserved MVI squared over four is equal to uh, one half times ML squared over eight times the disk squared plus one half ML squared over two rod squared. And so now we just have to solve these uh, equations to um, to move forward. Um, I'm going to do some canceling on this thing. I'm going to multiply everything by 8. So this picks up a 2. And that cancels this. And this picks up a 4. And I'm going to multiply everything on the, on the second one by... I guess 16. Um, so this one picks up a 4. And uh, this one goes away. And the other one picks up a 4. So. And I'll divide all of them by M. And. Um, I can divide the top one by L. And I don't think I can do any other simplifying. How about if I divide this one all by L? So uh, this top one becomes angular velocity of the disk 
is equal to minus four angular velocity rod. Okay, um, so then uh, the, I, let's do a substitution for vi squared is equal to L squared times 2vi over L minus 4 omega rod L squared plus 4 L squared omega rod L squared. Geez, you know, I'm a little bit worried I made an algebraic mistake. It just goes to show don't, uh, don't do that thing I did where you erase your original equations. <laughs> uh, we'll just go through it. 4vi squared over L squared minus 16vi um, omega rod over L plus 16 omega rod squared L squared, no L squared, not yet, plus 4L squared omega rod squared. <clears throat> And then I multiply through by L. Uh, so it's 4VI squared minus 16VI L omega rod plus 16L squared omega rod squared plus 4L squared omega rod squared. So this becomes 16VI L omega rod is equal to <clears throat> 20 L squared omega rod squared. Let's uh, factor out an omega rod. Oop. Factor out an L. Uh, divide by 4. Uh, so omega rod is equal to 4vi over 5l, and that means that, um, your disc is 2vi over l minus 16vi over 5l. Well, that's, that's fun. Uh, 10, so this is uh, minus 6vi over 5l. All right, so that's how the velocities are supposed to work out, I guess. Um, rotational speed of the dumbbell. Uh, that's this guy. And uh, the velocity of A, the final velocity of A. Well, okay, so now it's moving like that um, with angular velocity minus 6vi over 5l. Um, so the final speed is going to be um, L over two, the distance from the middle times omega. So the final speed is um, minus three. Oh, just write it out. Stop being a little baby. Minus six over five L times L over two omega. So that's minus three over five. Wait, 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 oh, 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 oh. Okay, that's your initial velocity. Okay, all right, all right. So your final velocity is going to be your angular velocity times r minus 6vi over 5l times l over 2. So that's minus 3vi over 5. That's how fast you're moving after the collision.
So that's fun, right? Sure, it's fun. Um, okay, that was a longer question than I thought it would be. Uh, 51. A disk of rotational inertia I about the center axis is shown in 11.51. Rotating about this axis with initial rotation angular velocity on low friction bearings. A second identical disk is held at rest a few meters directly above the first disk and suddenly dropped. After some slipping, the disks are observed with a common rotational speed about the original rotation. Find the magnitude of the rotational velocity of the combined disks. Um, okay, so... This is an angular momentum question. Each of these has moment of inertia I. Um, so uh, L total is going to be the momentum for the top one plus the momentum for the bottom one. So the momentum of the top one is uh, omega zero I. No, wait, it's zero. Zero times I. And the bottom one, it's omega I uh, times I. So that's the total angular momentum. And so after, when they're attached together, and they're rotating with the same angular velocity, <clears throat> L top total is equal to um, twice the amount of inertia times F. So omega theta I I is equal to two I omega F. So omega F is equal to omega theta I over two. Conservation of angular momentum. Have we talked about angular momentum in class? I think we're covering it next class. Not sure. Anyway, it's pretty fun. Um, so, oh, that's it. Now it's time to do the practice assignment. The practice assignment is on uh, mastering physics. You can do it not for credit. It's just good uh, experience. So, um, page 203, question 29. That's where we start. You attach, it says, one end of a string length L to a small ball of inertia M. Cool. You attach the spring's other end to a pivot that allows free revolution. Uh, <laughs> There's a reason you're not uh, supposed to let the do these experiments in like apartments, because uh, you know if this allows free revolution, then it will definitely leave marks on the wall. <laughs> marks. No, you don't like puns. Okay, we we'll move on then. <clears throat> uh, okay, you hold the ball out to the side of the spring top along a horizontal line, uh, like in this diagram. Okay, so sideways, there's the pivot, L. If you release the ball from rest, what's the tension in the string as a function of angle swept through? Oh, that's delightful. What's the maximum tension should the string be able to sustain it if you want to not break through the entire motion of the ball? Oh, this is a great question. Uh, this question's kind of hard for you. But, you know, uh, if you want to go into um, quantitative science, you can't be afraid of a couple equations. Okay, are you ready for this? So, <clears throat> the tension is determined effectively by the, um, uh, well, how should we put this? <sighs> First, I need to know how fast the ball's going. It's going in a circle, right? So the first thing I need to figure out is how fast it's moving. What principle can I use to figure that out? I can use conservation of energy. Um, so, uh, conservation of energy. 
So, um, that height, uh, the kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared at that height is going to be uh, essentially the amount of kinetic energy, uh, potential energy released. So it's going to be mg uh, height. So that's mg times L sine theta. So that'll tell you how fast you're moving. So v is equal to square root um, 2g L sine theta. And that's pretty fun. Okay. So what do we know about something moving in this particular way? It's a good question. This particular question is real sweet because, oh, hey, you know what? Um, no, you don't want to change to angular coordinates entirely. Okay, good, good. Sorry, sorry. I'm just thinking on my feet. <clears throat> okay. So let's think of this ball here. What do I know about its acceleration? Um, let me uh, let me write i hat in that direction and j hat in that direction. Okay. So here's the thing. I know that the acceleration vector is going to have a term in the i hat direction because it's moving in a circle but also it's going to have a sting in the j-hat direction because it's speeding up. What are these two values? Well, I, I know something about this. I don't know what this one is, question marks. But I do know what this value is. This value is going to be v squared over r towards the middle, right? So it's going to be um, square of this is 2gl sine theta divided by uh, the radius is l. Let me cancel those out. Boop, boop. I hat plus unknown value, j hat. <clears throat> uh, this tells me what the net force is, or at least some things about the net force. Uh, it's going to be 2gm times sine theta i hat plus, I don't know, j hat. Um, now, there's actually one thing you can do. I'm not actually interested in finding the component in front of j hat, I don't think, according to this question, because this question only cares about me figuring out what the tension is. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I don't need to figure it out. I can, I just don't want to. Um, so I'm, I'm just leaving it with question marks. Otherwise, I'd assign a variable to it. So, fun part. Let's talk about forces. What forces are on the object? There's gravity, and there's tension force. Uh, and then i hat and then j hat okay so before we go on you might be tempted to say that this is the tension uh that would be wrong and the reason it's wrong is because when i decompose the this force uh the force of gravity you get a component in the i hat direction and then a component in the j hat direction okay so in other words, the tension needs to provide this much acceleration, or right? But it also needs to do so by partially canceling out gravity. And that's going to depend on the angle. Uh, so what's this angle? Jeez. Um, OK, we, we wrote the angle. Oh! We wrote the angle here uh, as theta. Um, so theta is the angle between the horizontal and uh, the tension, uh, the i hat vector, I guess. Um, and that means that uh, this angle down here will also be theta. So the force of tension is just going to be purely i hat. Fine. Force of gravity is going to be mixed. Uh, part of it's going to pull in the negative i hat direction. 
Uh, so I guess this is going to be theta. Theta. Um, right angle. <clears throat> so the part in the i hat direction is going to be minus mg sine theta. And the part in the other one is going to be uh, in the j hat direction, which is nice. mg cosine theta in the j hat direction. Uh, so the thing about it is that the tension plus this one have to add up to this one. The I hat terms. So 2gm sine theta is equal to tension minus mg sine theta, which means tension is equal to 3mg sine theta. Well, that's interesting. Um, okay, so where's this the biggest? It's the largest when sine theta is equal to 1, right? Which is at the bottom of the arc. Think about it. At the bottom of the arc, it's traveling fastest, and also gravity's pulling it in the opposite direction. So it needs to provide the centripetal acceleration for a much faster moving object, plus totally cancel out gravity. Yep. All right. All done. That's a weird question. Pretty tricky. That's 29. That's the first question on the practice. That's crazy. 322. Three identical small one kilogram pucks are attached to identical 0 0.5 meter strings tied together to common center is shown. It's a ballo. When whirled in a circular motion at angular speed, uh, three rates per second, What's the rotational kinetic energy and the magnitude of the angular momentum about the common center? Boop, boop, boop. Um, so this is 0 0.5 meters, 0 0.5 meters, 0 0.5 meters, and one kilogram, one kilogram, one kilogram. All right, let's start by calculating the moment of inertia. So it's going to be mr squared for each of the terms. So it's going to be 1.0 times 0 0.5 all squared. 1.0 times 0 0.5 all squared. 1.0 times 0 0.5 all squared, which is equal to 0 0.75 kilogram meter squared. Okay, um, okay. so it's giving a circular motion, angular velocity, 3.0 rads per second. I write rad. Uh, radians are actually unitless. I started writing this because people have no idea what I'm doing. Um, but radians don't actually exist. That's just a mnemonic. Technically, the units in this case is 1 over s. So if you've been wondering about things, that's, that's why they're like that. Okay, so rotational kinetic energy, um, one half I omega squared, get out calculon. So it's uh, one half times 0.75 times three times three, 33.375 joules. Uh, angular momentum. Calculate the angular momentum, all you got to do is you go uh, I times omega. So it's 3 times 0 0.75. 2.25. Yep. Okay. That's 42. Let's do 46 now. 46 reads, consider the roller coaster car in problem 37. Oh, geez. What minimum value of starting height h above the ground must the car begin its journey if it's to remain on track at the top of the loop? Fun. Great.
Here's the ground. Uh, this is D. That here is H. Okay, so here's the thing. <clears throat> when it's at the top of the thing, it's going to have an acceleration downwards, right? Uh, what's going to go into this acceleration? There's going to be a force of gravity and a normal force. Okay? So, this acceleration can be as big as we need it to be, pretty much, until the floor breaks. It can be really, really, really big. But, it can't be really, really, really small. It can't be zero. Why? It has to do with the normal force here. This normal force can be bigger or smaller depending on the conditions. It can go down to being zero, but it can't point upwards because it's always perpendicular to the surface. And that means that, at the very least, the acceleration is going to be that of gravity. Okay. So essentially, at this moment, this car has some velocity going that way. Okay. And it's going to travel according to projectile motion. Bronk. Okay. And, you know, the, the smaller V is, the more projectile motion it's going to be as it leaves the track. But there's exactly one very special projectile motion that will keep it on the track for a little bit longer. Okay. It's going to have an ex downwards acceleration. The question is, what's that special projectile motion? Well, it's essentially the one where, um, where the velocity, or the, where this entire acceleration goes into being the centripetal acceleration. 9.81 is equal to v squared over r. OK? <clears throat> So what that means is that v squared, whatever it is, has to be 9.81 times the radius of the circle, whatever it is. And that means the kinetic energy at the top of the loop in this case has to be 1 half m times 9.81 times r. So this is the minimum amount of kinetic energy to stay on the track. If you're not tra if you don't have at least that much kinetic energy in this case, you're going to fall to your death. Okay. So, you need that much kinetic energy. And that's neat because we can talk about how much energy total it has if the system is the cart and the track and the ground and the earth. Kinetic energy plus gravitational potential energy. Uh, so the kinetic energy is one half mgr, and the gravitational potential energy is going to be mg times the current height, which is d plus two r. Okay, so this is how much energy, total energy, the cart needs for it to stay on the track when it's at the top. And that means that it must have the same amount of energy when it starts out. It starts out with no kinetic energy. mg height is equal to 1 half mgr plus mg times d plus 2r. OK. You know what? I'm going to copy this equation now I can factor stuff out okay so each of these terms has a G boop 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 each of these terms has an M boop boop hey look it's a relationship the height has to be um, oh wait I factored in this M out Okay, good. Um, the height has to be 5 over 2r plus d. That's fun.
do that in your tutorial as well. Okay, what's the next question? That one is 46. Now it's question 49. 49 goes like this. Two skaters skate towards each other, each moving at 3.3 meters per second. Their lines of motion are separated by a perpendicular distance of 2 meters. Just as they pass each other, still 2 meters apart, they link hands and spin about their common center of mass. What's the rotational speed of the couple as the center mass? Treat each skater as a particle, one with inertia 75 kilograms, the other with inertia 48 kilograms. All right. What does all this mean? It means you got a skater over here, 75 kilograms. And they're traveling with some velocity, 3.3 meters per second. And they're traveling, or they would, along a straight line. And then down here, you got another skater, 60 kilograms. No, 48 kilograms. And they're traveling this way, 3.3 meters per second. And they're traveling along a straight line. And it says that the distance between these two lines is two meters. And the fun thing happens when they pass each other. At this moment, they link hands. And they start to spin around their center of mass. Where's their center of mass? It's right here somewhere. <clears throat> uh, so how fast do they spin? Um, so there's two ways to do this, um, but let's do the fun way, okay? Fun way is this. This guy is going in a small circle or a circle, I'll call it RA. This one's going in a big circle. Dag. RB. <clears throat> I need to figure out what, well, I need to figure out a bunch of things. But here's the thing, RA plus RB is equal to 2, and I know that the angular velocity of A is equal to the angular velocity of B because they're rigidly rotating, and I know that the angular velocity of A times RA is equal to 3.3, and the angular velocity of B times RB is equal to 3.3. Is that enough to answer this question? Six point six divided by two is equal to three point three rate per second. I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't know if that works. I'm gonna do it the proper way. Uh, the proper way involves angular momentum here. I'm gonna cut and cut and copy these all around. I I'm I'm suspicious that this I think I made a weird assumption. I'm just move this over here. Maybe it's down here. Probably doesn't work. Uh, we use the conservation of angular momentum. Okay, so uh, the deal here is that um, no, pardon me. Uh, the issue here is that I need to figure out what R A and R B are, right? How do I do that? Um, well, I know what their masses are. Um, so I could just do like, 
I don't know if you remember, we did one of these a while ago. You take the average of their position, their system together. Let's say that this position is y is equal to zero, and this position is y is equal to two. Um, and uh, the value of the COM is equal to the mass average of all these positions. So it's gonna be uh, the mass of the bottom, 48 times its position, plus the mass of the top, which is um, 75 times its position, two, divided by the total mass. So that's equal to, <clears throat> one point two two meters so this location is one point two two meters that means this bottom radius is one point two two meters long and this top radius here is um, zero point seven eight meters <clears throat> so let's confirm that these should get this gives you the same angular velocity because V uh, should be omega times r, right? So omega is equal to v over r. They have the same velocity, 3.3 .3 divided by, okay, so the top one, 3.3 .3 divided by, <gasps> Oh my gosh, hold on. I need to read this question again. Okay, let me finish the calculation. Um, um, it's the, oh geez. Uh, the top one is 0 0.78. 4.23 meters. And bottom, V over R. It's going to be 33.3 um, 3 times 1.22. It's going to give me a different number. 2.7 rads per second. Rad per second. This question is super awesome and super subtle. And I did a bunch of things incorrectly here, but I did something really neat. So uh, does that give the same number as here? No. Would I expect them to have the same angular velocity? Uh, yeah, I would. Let me reread the question though. Two skaters skate towards each other, moving at blah. Their lines of motion are separated by some distance. They link hands and spin about this common center of mass. What is the rotational speed of the couple about the center of mass? Should be the same, right? Treat each skater as a particle with this inertia. Okay, so what did you write? Around the center of mass. That's cool. Here's the notable thing. Is the center of mass going to move? Yeah. Yeah, it is. These two skaters aren't going to rotate in place. They're going to, their center of mass is going to move sideways. Which way? Probably this way. Okay. And so, and so, these velocities aren't the way I pictured them. So. Let's start this question again. Uh, some, of the, some of the work we did before can stay. Uh, like us calculating the, uh, the center of mass. That was good. That works. But I need to, I need to note something here. So this point says a velocity this point, this has a velocity, right? And between them, there's a center of mass. And we know these distances between it, which is cool. But there's something neat here, which is that the center of mass is going to move. Uh, 
Because the system has momentum. Let's calculate the momentum of the system. Um, uh, all right. Okay. So uh, the momentum of the system, P total, is going to be 75 times 3.3 uh, plus 48 times minus 3.3. <clears throat> minus 80.1. So the velocity of the system is going to be the total momentum divided by uh, 75 plus 48. Okay, why did I tell you all this? Um, <clears throat> I told you all this because the motion of these two objects aren't going to be in circles. When we started, we kind of assumed that this one was going to go in a circle, and then this velocity would correspond to its angular velocity, and that this one was going to go in a circle, and that its velocity was going to correspond to an angular velocity. And those angular velocities are going to be the same. And we did the math, and it wasn't true. This is a pretty advanced question. What's the problem? The problem is that they're not going to go in circles. They're going to go in circles, but they're all going to also going to move forward. So instead of going in a circle, this is one on top is going to go like that. Okay, and the one on the bottom is going to go like. Well, maybe that it needs to be a bigger one. The one on the bottom. The one on the bottom is going to go like that. some weird thing, okay? Those motions are totally bananas um, because they're a combination, they're called cycloids. Um, they're a combination of this lateral motion, the center of moving, plus the angular velocity. So to properly analyze it, all I have to do, in, in other words, um, in other words, their current velocity as I define it can be split up in terms of being part of it is from the center of mass moving and part of it is from angular velocity. And this one is part of it is uh, angular velocity and part of it is the uh, center of mass. Okay. Just kind of like the wheel. So the long story short, and this is a long story, and I should have told it a lot shorter, is that to properly analyze the system, I need to go to the zero momentum reference frame. Wait, wait, hold on, before I do anything. 75 times 3.3, 48 times 3.3. This should be a positive number. 891 divided by 75 plus 48. Okay. All right, so um, long story short, I'm going to convert to the center of mass uh, zero momentum reference frame. And that means I'm going to subtract this velocity off of both of these velocities. So the one on the top ends up going slower, and the one on the bottom ends up going faster. <clears throat> so one up here is 3.3 minus 0.724, and this one down here is minus 3.3 minus 0.724. So this is 2.576 meters per second, and this bottom one is 
4.024 meters per second. So if I did things right, uh, so this one is 1.22 meters, and this is 0 0.78 meters. Uh, we should be able to convert these and figure out what the angular velocity is. <clears throat> so the angular velocity of the top one should be the same as the angular velocity of the bottom one. We can use the calculation to check. Two point five seven six divided by point seven eight, three point three rated for second, and bottom is equal to four. I guess that has a minus sign. Four point zero oh two four divided by one point two two, three point three rated per second. Yay! They're the same. That question was great. Oh, I'm so happy. What a bonkers question. Okay, so yeah, think about all the things you learned having to watch me do this bonkers question. Actually, was that... <gasps> what? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so, um, that's question 49. Woof, that was a wicked question. Question 53. Oh, hey, hey, pen. 53. Question 53 goes like, what's the rotational inertia about the x-axis? For the rigid object in... 103. Okay, treat the balls as particles. Um, so here's, I'm going to reproduce the diagram. There's mass, that's R. Here's the mass, and this is 1 half R, and this is 4M. That's the angle there, and that's the same angle there. <coughs> Okay, so this is a fun question because when we calculate the moment of inertia, we're adding up m r squared for each of the terms, right? Um, I'll call this one term A, term B, term C. Uh, so for example, the moment of inertia of part B is gonna be same mass zero because it's zero distance away from the axis of rotation. Uh, but what about these other ones? Their distance from the axis of rotation aren't r and r over 2, because these here are the distances, right? So i of a is going to be the mass is m. This distance, uh, r star, r star, all squared. M R sine of theta all squared. Similarly, for B, oh wait, that one's zero. Uh, for C, it's going to be the mass is 4M and R star is 1 half R sine of theta squared. Uh, so let's add them up and simplify them. I total is going to be m r squared sine squared theta plus 4m times 1 over 4 times r squared sine squared theta. And hey, you combine them. This becomes 2m r squared sine squared theta. Ta-da! That's pretty fun. All right, that is the end of the practice assignment. I don't see any other questions on the things, so let's move on to doing uh, the final, or at least until I get tired, which I'm getting tired. Okay. Oof. 
So the first page has a thing. Just remember about your final exams. It's up to you to figure out when the final exam is and to attend your final exam. If you come any later than half an hour, they won't let you write it. Instead, what they do is they make you go to the dean's office. And the dean's office says, no, you were supposed to go to the exam and you didn't. No exams for you. So uh, this is last year's final exam. It's pretty fun. Let's do it. OK, consider the graph below describing the collisions of the two cart. If cart A has inertia 2 kilograms, what's the inertial cart B? <clears throat> um, I don't know. Let's see. Um, we know that delta VA over delta VB is going to be equal to minus MB over MA. Uh, delta VA, that's minus 2. Delta VB is uh, plus 3. Uh, minus MB, and Macari has 2 kilograms. So MB is equal to 4 over 3 kilograms. <clears throat> I want to go into a game of Wheel of Fortune. The grand prize is located at a position at the top of the wheel, shown. Uh, I forgot to show the wheel. Oh, so it's, it's there. Prize. <clears throat> I win if the wheel stops when the prize is in the position on the right. Win. Um, theta initial is equal to pi over 2. Win is theta is equal to 0. Or 2 pi. Or 4 pi. Or 8 pi. Whatever. <laughs> I note that when another contestant sets the wheel spinning, it takes 4 seconds to stop. <clears throat> Which of the initial velocities should I spin to win the prize? All right, so this is a this is a kinematics question. Um, you know, your angular position is theta i plus omega i times t uh, plus um, alpha over two t squared. Omega is equal to omega i plus alpha times t. Okay. So here's the things that I know. I know my initial position is theta over 2. It's pi over 2. Um, I don't know what my initial velocity is. That's one of these guys. Um, what about acceleration? I don't know what my acceleration is. But here's the thing, um, arguably, the, when the other contestant spun it, it's going to have the same acceleration. So when the other contestant spun it, omega i is equal to, their initial velocity was pi over 2 rads per second. Um, so omega is equal to omega i plus alpha t. We knew that it took 4 seconds to stop. Uh, times t is equal to 4. Um, and so alpha is going to be minus pi over 8. So uh, this term becomes minus pi over 8. And this term here becomes minus pi over 16. Because you divide it by 2. OK. So, hmm, I don't know how, I don't know how long it's going to take to stop, but I do know what my final position kind of wants to be. Um, and I do know that when it stops, omega is going to be zero. So when it stops, omega 
well, this should be zero. And my angle wants to be two pi. Now keep in mind, I could have answered this with four pi and eight pi. Probably only one of these corresponds to the right answer though. Um, <clears throat> so, um, let's see. I guess I can just keep solving things here. <clears throat> Um, T stop is equal to eight omega I over pi. So two pi is equal to pi over two plus omega I eight over pi. Um, And we'll do some canceling here, just because um, that becomes a four. Um, don't forget the minus sign. And uh, move the other one to the other side. So this becomes four. So this becomes three over two. And um, you combine these two. Yeah. Combine these two, and you this becomes a four. Erase, erase, erase. And um, so three over eight. I squared. Square root three divided by eight. Zero point six one. Nope. Okay, well what if it went all the way around once? Jeez. Uh, so what if this was four pi? How would that change things? Uh, this would be seven pi over two. And then it would be <clears throat> seven pi over eight. Oh wait, hold on. Hold on here, I did the math wrong. Okay, so forget that. Uh, so if it was just two pi, hold on, here, okay. Two pi, then this would be three and this would be, the omega squared would be uh, three pi squared over eight. Those pi's don't cancel out. Three times pi times pi divided by eight. Square root answer, 1.92, yeah. Which of the following is true? If I throw an object straight up in the air vertically, its kinetic energy at the highest point will be zero. That's definitely true, because I threw it straight up. If I throw an object diagonally up in the air, its kinetic energy at the highest point will be zero. No, it's still moving sideways at the top. If I throw the object diagonally up in the air, its momentum at the highest point is zero. No, it's still moving at the top. If I throw an object up in the air, the system is composed of the earth <laughs> and the object is closed. Okay, so usually when we do these uh, projectile motion questions, we're ignoring the air. But given the fact that I wrote air in capitals, I'm guessing the air has to be included for the closed system. Air is going to produce a little bit of drag force. It's going to slow the object down just a little bit. Air is going to heat up just a little bit. So this is not true. Yeah, it's a trick question. It's not a trick question. It's a tricky question. What do we mean when this? What do we mean when we say a system is isolated? It's isolated if its center mass is moving with constant velocity. That's true. It's isolated if energy isn't entering or losing the system. No, that's that's closed systems. Uh, a system is isolated if all the external forces on it are balanced. That's true. Uh, a system is isolated if its total momentum is constant. I think that's also true. 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 
What do we mean when we say a process is dissipative? Dissipative process is when the total mechanical energy you're not conserved. We didn't really talk about mechanical energy this term. It didn't focus on the term mechanical energy. Um, but yeah, yeah. Total mechanical energy not conserved. That's dissipative. The energy is dissipating into heat. Irreversible processes are dissipative. Yes, we know that. I covered that in class. Coherent deformations are dissipative. No. Incoherent deformations. Yes, they are. Breaking stuff. If the total kinetic energy is not constant all the way through the interaction, the process is dissipative. Um, no, because you can have energy turning into potential energy. So, no. Captain Picard and Captain Kirk are both standing... Oh, here's one thing to note. I drew much nicer diagrams in the exam that year. I just had to re reproduce the diagrams as best I could uh, for, for, for the purposes of the practice exam. So they look like ass because I didn't work very hard. <clears throat> Captain Picard's are standing in their own spaceships, each one moving with a constant but different velocity. Okay. They carefully watch and measure from the two spaceships an asteroid exploding into two parts. They compare their final numbers, which numbers will agree. The momentums of the two asteroid pieces will be the same. That's not true. And be different. Total momentum vectors they use to describe that both pieces will be the same. No. The system's momentum is going to be different. The change in the momentum vector they determine for each piece of the asteroid before and after the explosion will be the same. That's true. Uh, the impulse is the same because the force over time is the same. The force vector they determine each piece of the asteroid felt during the explosion will be the same. Yes, the rate of change. That's the rate of change of the impulse. Or sorry, yeah, it's the rate of change of the impulse. Um, the final velocity vectors... No, it's not the rate of change. It's the rate of change of momentum. Anyway, the final velocity vectors they use to describe the asteroid pieces will be the same. No, they won't. The final speeds they measure will be the same. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, no, of course not. They both agree on how much kinetic energy each asteroid piece has. No. They'll both agree on the total on the kinetic energy, oh, okay. They'll both agree on how the total, how the kinetic energy of each of the pieces has changed. I don't think this one's true. It's a, I, I spent way more time on this particular issue uh, when we went to this class. So I, I don't think that's right. I don't know, you'd have to work that one out uh, with reference frames. Uh, the total kinetic energy of the system has changed. Yes, that's definitely true. They both agree on how the internal energy of the system has changed. Yes. Okay. Newton's third law tells us that if two objects are interacting, they feel equal and opposite force vectors. Yes, the consequence of this is circle. That's true. If two objects push each other, they accelerate in opposite directions. That's true. Two objects pushing each other, their velocity will change by the same amount. That's false. If two objects push on each other, their momentum will change by the same amount. Yeah, that's a consequence. If you have a complicated system with many objects, only external forces can cause the center of mass to accelerate. That's true. We didn't really focus on that too much this term, but it's true. It's because internal interactions can't change how the center of mass is moving. If you have a complicated system made of many objects, all the external forces can add or remove energy from the system. Uh... Hi? Huh. I think that's true. I mean, the statement is true. But is that a consequence of Newton's third law? Again, I spent a lot more time on this particular question that year. What's the answer? It's kind of trivial. Well, these minutia, the minutia of this term are slightly different than last term. Um,
I don't think it's true. This is like a work thing, right? Then again, there's like temperature. I don't think it's true. I'll do a question mark next to that. Okay, I drew a really nice bear last year. Bears look like that. But, whatever. Bear went jump, bungee jumping. Starting at the top of a very high bridge, elastic cords are tied to his feet, and he jumps off the bridge. Once it's fallen a certain distance... Okay, careful to note something here. Once it's fallen a certain distance, the force of the bungee cord slows his descent until he is at the lowest point. If the system under consideration is the bear, the air, the earth... Discuss the work done by the bungee cord as the bear descends. Okay, so the tension points up. That's true. The bear moves down. That's true. So negative work is being done. Yes. Tension points down. Bear moves down. So negative work is done. No. Tension points up, the bear moves down, so positive work is done. No. No, it's this one. The the bungee cord's taking energy out of the system. It's slowing down the uh, the bear. But also, it's taking away some of the gravitational potential energy. Gravitational potential energy turns to kinetic energy, which the uh, tension extracts. Which has greater momentum, a flying bumblebee or a stationary train? Which has more inertia? Okay, so if V is equal to zero, its momentum is going to be zero. So the stationary train has no momentum, so the B has more. Which one has bigger inertia? The train has more inertia than the B. If you're sitting as a passenger seat of a car that makes a quick left turn, your shoulders seem to lean to the right. And the soup cans on the floor all roll to the right. I talked a lot about cans and garbage on the floor of a car that year. Uh, what caused the apparent rightward motion? Okay. There's a force pushing everything to the right. Your head and eyes are not an inertial reference frame, so things are moving for no reason. Your car is moving along a circular path in the centripetal acceleration is required without a force to push it towards the middle objects will not move in a circle along with the rest of the car and will move relative to the car's interior okay so this is true that's false this is true so here's your car at the start and here's your car after it's turned a bit it's moved in a circle okay there's some junk inside the car Junk inside a car doesn't feel a force because the normal force and friction aren't big enough. And so it will travel in a straight line and move inside the car. So from above, it won't be moving, but inside the car it seems to. And what causes it to accelerate? You're not in an inertial reference frame, so it will accelerate even though there's no force on it. Turning to the right, force your car to tilt to all the cards and shoulders shift downhill. That's not true. Often a wedge-shaped doorstop won't hold the door unless you kick it slightly under the door. What does forcing a wedge into a tight fit accomplish? Here's your door. Here's the floor. Here's your wedge. That's, a, that's the worst wedge anybody's ever drawn. Here's the wedge. So, uh... Does pushing on it increase the coefficient of friction? No, the coefficient of friction depends on the materials. Did doing so increases the normal force between the floor and the bottom of the wedge? It does. Because now it's not just the uh, gravity on the wedge, it's also the door pushing the wedge down. So that's true. Normal force has to accommodate both. In this position, moving the door into the wedge to close it will increase static friction force between the wedge and the floor. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think so. 
it won't increase the static friction force. If this guy moves this way, well, uh, that doesn't really, okay, hold on. So the way this goes is if the door moves this way, the door will have to push down on the, uh, the wedge. And in pushing down on the wedge, it will also try to move the wedge that way. And then so friction between the wedge and the floor holds it in place. So that's going to be true regardless and doesn't depend on us forcing the wedge in, I don't think. Um, question mark. Doing so causes the friction to become kinetic friction instead of fraction of static friction. No, that's not what it does. Ghosts, it keeps ghosts from pushing the doors shut. Uh, that's false. Ghosts don't care about doors. Okay, rolling without slipping. Hey, it's that question we were talking about earlier in the tutorial. Um, so, so we didn't talk about this in class because I mean. I don't know. The idea is when something's rolling across the ground, the bottom will not slide across the surface. And the top of the wheel moves it twice as fast as the center of the wheel. It's a relative velocity thing. We explained it an hour ago. Um, but the moral story is, if a wheel radius r is rolling, such as the center has velocity v, then the wheel's angular velocity must be v over r. So the smaller radius, the faster it needs to spin given velocity. Fine. Suppose I have a sphere in a solid wood and a hoop made of heavy metal, and both have the same mass and the same radius. I decide to race the two of them and let them roll from rest down a flat ramp. Which one of them reaches the bottom first? We talked about this actually a, a little while ago. Somebody asked literally this question. The idea is that one of them goes like that, and the other one goes like that. <clears throat> okay. So here's the thing. Uh, here's the way this question is different uh, than the previous one. Um, this is all about comparing their moments of inertia. This one has more of the mass farther from the middle than this one. This one has a lower density, so more of the mass is closer to the middle. This one, all the mass is an equal radius. So this one has a bigger I. Why does that matter? It matters because um, the gravitational potential energy, GMH, for both of the things, is going to be split between the kinetic energy and the uh, moment of inertia. But the neat thing is we can write the 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 rotational velocity in terms of the uh, the actual velocity, I think I wrote an equation up here, v squared over r squared. Okay. <clears throat> so gmh is equal to one half m plus i over r squared v squared. So the question is, which one moves faster? I'm talking about its speed, right? Its speed's going to be this number divided by this number. So the bigger the moment of inertia is, the smaller the speed's going to be. In other words, it takes uh, something with a bigger moment of inertia, it takes it more energy to get it up to a certain speed, to roll at a certain speed. So which one goes faster? The hoop because it has less rotational inertia. No, that's not true. The sphere because it has less rotational inertia. Well, that part's true. Less total energy will be taken up in rotational kinetic energy and more will be in translational kinetic energy. Sure, that's true. Uh, they both reach the bottom at the same time because gravity calls all things to have the same acceleration regardless of mass. Uh, well, that's true, but not if it includes a rotation. There's not enough information to answer this question, and frankly, I resent that you're asking us to put information we talked about in class together in new ways during the final exam. No, you're not allowed to resent me for that. Okay, long answer questions. <clears throat> Before we go on, uh, some of these long answer questions involve moment of inertia. 
Uh, inside your books, there's a list of moment of inertias. I forget which page it is. It's I've listed it somewhere here. <clears throat> so for your own for your own practice, moments of inertia are listed on page not that one. Okay. Page 275 has a list of all the formulas for moments of inertia. Um, you don't need to include them on your, uh, on your cheat sheet uh, because we'll be giving them to you uh, during the exam. So we'll give you essentially a photocopy of, this, of, the, of the diagram on this page. Uh, so you'll have to know how to use them, but we, we don't care about you coming up with them yourselves. So look at your dinner plate. Its mass is 1.2 kilograms and its radius is 0.3. All right, hold on. So its moment of inertia is going to be uh, that of a solid cylinder, so 1 half its mass uh, times its uh, radius squared. So its moment of inertia is going to be 0 0.054. Um, okay. So the frequency here is three times per second. Uh, let's convert that into an angular velocity. So it's going to be three rotations per second. So there's two pi radians per rotation. So it's 6 pi 1 over s. OK, so the angular velocity is omega times i. 6 times pi times 0.054. Um, kilogram uh, meter squared per second. Uh, the moment of inertia. Oh, wait, hold on. This question's only asking for the angular velocity. Sorry, I thought it was asking for the angular momentum. OK, so then it wanted me to calculate the moment of inertia. Did that there. Uh, initial angular momentum, that's this guy here. Uh, final angular velocity of the system. OK, so that's the fun part. I need to calculate the moment of inertia of the cake. Um, same formula, it's solid cylinder. Uh, the mass of the cake is 2.4, and its radius is 0.25 all squared. So that is 0 0.075. Okay. So, uh, the moment of inertia of the plate is equal to 0 0.054. Um, so when they're rotating together, their moments of inertia are, just add them together, 0 0.129. Uh, the angular momentum is going to be the same as it was before. So the angular velocity is 1.05 divided by 0 0.129. 7.9 radians per second. Energy dissipated. OK, so to figure out what the energy dissipated is, I need that. Ke, one half i omega squared. So initially, one half. Uh, the moment of inertia is 0 0.54, and the angular velocity is 0 0.054. Nope, six pi. Zero point five oh nine joules. K 
kinetic energy final is one half with 0 0.129, 7.9 all squared. What? <clears throat> what nonsense is this? Oh, someone's at the door. Alright, what wizardry is this? The angular velocity should be smaller. Let's see, the initial angular velocity is 6 times pi, so it's 18. Six times pi times six. Oh, okay. I made a mistake. I forgot to square things. Whoa, I sure did. Okay. So it's that squared. You're supposed to learn something when I make these mistakes. You're supposed to learn that everybody makes mistakes, including you, when you write the final exam. And so when you make mistakes, just keep an eye out for them. As you go along, ask yourself, does the answer I'm getting make sense? Don't just, uh, don't just uh, do whatever, punch in the code, see what you get. Always ask yourself, does the number make sense? Is this supposed to be a negative number? This number is supposed to be bigger, I think. Um, and in doing so, uh, you know, keep your eyes open for mistakes. Little mistakes happen all the time. Question two, I decided to set up a very elaborate physics apparatus consisting of a two kilogram brick, <clears throat> which is attached to the wall with a spring placed on a conveyor belt. The end of the spring starts out three meters from the wall and its rest length is three. I'll call this x is equal to zero because I'm not great. Okay, the spring constant is five kilo, uh, newtons per meter. Coefficient of sliding friction is 0.2. Coefficient of static friction is 0.5. You turn on the conveyor belt to accelerate the brick gently forwards in such a way as the belt stays, brick stays in place upon the belt. So it's being stretched. and staying in place. What's the maximum possible acceleration the belt can have for the brick to stay in place on the brick when it's three meters from the wall? Hmm. Okay. Um, so let's go J hat, I hat. <clears throat> Acceleration vector, if we don't want it to accelerate vertically, uh, you want it to accelerate horizontally, you don't know how much. F net, 0 j hat plus 2 a i hat, fine. Okay, what forces are there? It's going to be the normal force. There's going to be gravity. Normal force, F g. There's going to be a static friction force. Static friction is going to be as big as it needs to be. Um, is there going to be a spring force? No. Brick is currently three meters from the wall, and that means that... <laughs> K times zero. It's at its rest length, so there's no force. Okay, so... Um, Normal force is going to be big and up. I don't know how big. 
fg is going to be minus 9.81 times 2 in the j hat direction. So minus 19.6 j hat. And f friction is going to be little f. Hmm. It's static friction. Remember that static friction doesn't have a number associated with it. It is, it is as big as it needs to be in, in context. Um, so uh, what this means is you put it together, uh, the i hat terms become 2a is equal to no i hat terms. Oh, this is in the i hat direction. And the uh, normal, uh, the j hat terms are going to be 0 is equal to n minus 19.6. So the normal force is going to be 19.6 Newton strong. OK, static friction force, it's as big as it needs to be up until a certain point. When it has its maximum acceleration, which is what we're asking about, that's going to involve the static friction being at its max. The maximum static friction is mu times n, which is 19.6 times 0.5, 9.8 newtons. So that's the maximum amount of static friction corresponding to an acceleration, divide that by 2, of 4.9 meters per second squared. So that's the maximum I can accelerate. That's the maximum I can accelerate the uh, the uh, belt uh, without the thing slipping at that point. What would happen to the brick when it's three meters from the wall if I'd set the conveyor belt to accelerate more rapidly than an answer from part A? If it was more rapid, it would slip. In other words, the belt would be going accelerating faster than the brick would. A belt is going to be bigger than a brick. If it was too fast, that would be it. And the friction force would be kinetic friction, sliding friction. Two surfaces slide across each other. And in that case, the friction force is going to be uh, mu kinetic times n, which was 0.2. Uh, 19.6 times 0 0.2 is 3.92 newtons. And the acceleration would be 1.96 newtons. Okay, so if you made the belt slide too fast at this location, the brick will only accelerate forward at a is equal to 1.96 meters per second squared instead of this one. So it'll go forward more slowly. Once a brick has moved too far from its original location, the spring will then pull it towards the wall. The brick then moves back and forth until it settles down into a new equilibrium position. What's the equilibrium position from the wall? Okay, so here's x equals 0. That's 3 meters away. Okay, so it's in equilibrium, so it's not moving. In this case, 0 i hat, 0 j hat, f net is going to be 0 i hat, 0 j hat. All of the forces are in balance. Uh, what forces are on it? Uh, there's a normal force. It's gravity. OK. Which direction is friction going to pull? Oh my gosh. Oh no, I did it right. 
Phew. Uh, which direction is friction going to pull? Friction's going to pull this way. It's going to be kinetic friction. And then the spring is going to pull it that way. Okay. As before, uh, gravity is going to be, let's see, I calculated this already, 19.6. Uh, J hat, F N. I don't know what it is. J hat, um, F kinetic friction is going to be whatever this number is times mu. So it's going to be zero point. What was it? Two, zero point two times N J hat, and K spring. Kind of depends on how far this is. Delta x. That's going to be in the negative j hat direction, and it's going to have magnitude 5 minus 5 times delta x. Um, also, that's not a j hat, it's an i hat. And then we put it all together. The i hat terms become 0 is equal to 0 0.2 n minus 5 delta x. And the j hat terms become net force is 0 minus 19.6 um, plus n. We put them together. n is equal to 19.6. And so delta x is equal to, hold on. Zero point seven eight four meters. Um, so it's three meters away from the wall, and it's seven eight four meters away from its resting position. Its resting position is three meters away from the wall. So the distance to the wall is. 3.784 meters. Okay. So I would like some children and I've made a game with a spring and a smooth slope and a little ball. Uh, I guess it's moment of inertia is effectively zero. Let's don't worry about that. The slope is 25 degrees above the horizontal and the spring is placed in a hole such that when it's compressed at the proper starting position, uh, it's been compressed, it's at height h equals zero. The spring's been compressed by three centimeters and is a spring constant, blah. The ball is pushed up the slope by the spring. How has the ball, ball traveling when it's 0.6 meters up the slope? Okay, I'm gonna assume it's frictionless. This is an energy question. So um, the total energy is going to be the spring potential energy plus the kinetic energy plus the gravitational potential energy. So initially, uh, the spring potential energy is 0 0.03 times 600. Wait, it's um, 1 half k delta x delta x squared so I need to use a slightly different formula one half what's k 600 delta x is 0 0.03 all squared kinetic energy is zero gravitational potential energy is zero zero point two seven joules Yeesh. Okay, so um, the final position that we're talking about, spring potential energy is zero. The kinetic energy, I don't know how fast it's traveling. The mass of the ball is 0.2 V squared. Uh, the gravitational potential energy depends on how high that is. So it's going to be M 
which is 0 0.2 times g, 9.81 times that height, 0 0.06 times sine of 25 degrees. And that's going to add up to be 0 0.27. Okay, let's do it. <clears throat> Make sure your calculator is in the right units. That it's, in this case, that it's in uh, degrees. Point two seven minus answer times 2 divided by point 0.2 square root answer. It's traveling at 1.48 meters per second. <clears throat> How fast is the ball traveling when it's 0.12 meters up the slope? Same deal. 0 0.27 joules is equal to 1 half times 0 0.2. Yep. Uh, okay. Um, so it's zero spring energy, uh, V squared, that's the kinetic energy. Um, 0 0.2 mass, G, distance up the slope. There you go. One point three meters per second. What's the maximum distance the ball reaches from the bottom of the slope? So when is V is equal to zero? Um, that corresponds to zero point two seven is equal to zero spring energy, zero kinetic energy, mass times uh, nine point eight one times the height max. The maximum height is zero point one three seven meters. But keep in mind that that is on a triangle twenty five degrees zero point one three seven. This is the quantity we're asking about. One three seven divided by sine of twenty five. That's zero point three two meters, so thirty two centimeters. What's the acceleration of the ball as it goes up the slope? Well, it's free by diagram. Write the final acceleration in terms of i pointing down slope and j perpendicular to slope. Like that. Um, okay, what are the forces? There's gravity, and this is a 25 degree angle, and then there's a normal force. Normal force vector is purely in the j-hat direction. Gravity, though, is a combination of the two. So, j-hat, i-hat, FG vector, it's going to have some component. Okay, so wait, wait what, are the, what are the angles here? Um, this one's 25 degrees. Um, yep. So this is going to be, in the J hat direction, it's going to be minus MG. Uh, cosine 25 j hat direction mg sine 25 yeah, i hat direction uh, 
Um, yep. Okay. Um, so, uh, what do we know about the acceleration? It's got no part in the j hat direction and some value in the i hat direction. So f net is going to be zero in the j hat direction plus zero point two the mass times a in the i hat direction. So put it all together. The i hat terms. There's only one of them. So zero point two a is equal to zero point two the mass times nine point eight one times sine twenty five and j hat. 0 n minus mg, hold on, <clears throat> mass 0 0.2 g 9.81 cosine 25. Now, I only care about the acceleration. So the acceleration is going to be 9.81 times sine of 25. 4.1 per second squared. That's the magnitude in the i hat direction. What's the acceleration of the ball down the slope? It's the same. Why? All the forces are just the same. A very, it's a terrible bear. A very bored bear decides to jump across the stream. The stream's four meters wide, uh, one meter higher than the bank, you know, is the other end of the stream. The bear can jump with an initial velocity of two, two meters per second I hat. Poor J hat starts three meters in the air, halfway up a sturdy tree. The origin's at the foot of the bear's jumping tree. So this is where the origin is. Um, okay, so now I need to find the um, projectile motion question. X, Y, V, X, V, Y. Okay, so its initial position along the X axis is zero. Its initial position along the Y axis is three. Its initial velocity in the x direction is two. Its initial velocity in the y direction is four. Its acceleration in the zero in the x direction is zero. Its acceleration in the y direction is 9.81. So this is um, two, and this one is four minus 9.81 times t. Does the bear make it to the other side of the stream? Mm, how do we answer that? When is x is equal to 4? Um, x is equal to 4 when t is equal to 2 seconds. Let's find the altitude at 2 seconds. All right, so where's the altitude there? If he is above one meter, then he made it. Minus 8.62, no, he didn't make it to the other side of the stream. Uh, where's his highest position above the stream? Uh, Okay, so his highest position is when vy is equal to zero. Not going up, not going down. Stopped going up, started going down. Four minus 9.81. So uh, that is at time t is equal to 0 0.407 uh, seconds. All right, 
so at that time, the y value is 3 plus 4 times 0 0.407 minus 9.81 over 2.407 all squared. And the value of x is 0 plus 2 times 0 0.407. Three point eight two meters is the highest distance, and zero point eight one four meters. Sad bear. Uh, what's its velocity? V y is equal to zero. V x. Uh, it's good. Two meters per second. <laughs> cool. Uh, questions about easier in the frame of an observer moving with velocity. Blood. Describe why. Uh, um uh relative to this observer bear only has uh velocity in y direction and so at max height uh, k is equal to zero you can use kinetic energy is if if you're in the zero is that the reference frame jasper sends the cliffs and gently rolls her bucket of water to the ground using a rope the bucket starts out with an initial downward velocity but Jasper is tightening her grip on the rope as it slides through her hand so that it slows as it descends. And when the bucket touches the ground, it has velocity zero. Consider the energy of the situation and how, how work is being done. Describe if the system is closed, the types of energy, and if they're increasing or decreasing. The work external forces being positive and negative if the system consists of Jasper, the rope, the bucket, the air, and the earth. The system is closed. Uh, types of energy. There's a GPE, KE, a thermal. Yeah. Uh, the gravitational potential energy is decreasing. Kinetic energy is decreasing. Thermal is increasing. Uh, the work. There's no other forces. No other work. Rope, the bucket, the air, the earth. Not including Jasper. So it's open. Uh, the energy is uh, the change of gravitational potential energy. There's kinetic energy. Uh, there's some thermal. Mm. It's no thermal for now. Um, so the gravitational potential energy is decreasing, kinetic energy is decreasing. There's work from friction in Jasper's hands. And that's taking energy out of the system. What if it's just the bucket? Uh, the bucket only has gravitational, uh, it's open because its energy is changing. It doesn't have GPE, it only has kinetic energy. And that changes and it decreases. Um, so in this case, uh, there's two forces on it. There's tension force and gravity. Fg does positive work. Uh, the tension force does negative work. So it takes energy out of the system. Derivation, using a force acting on a single particle, pointing in the direction of motion, which accelerates distance delta x, show that the work done will be that. Okay, so what you do is this. You're like, okay, you got an object, and then there's a force, and then the object moves from here over to here. Okay. Uh, it will undergo constant acceleration. 
right? Um, so the deal here is it's going to have constant acceleration. So delta x is equal to um, v initial, yeah, v initial um, plus a over 2t squared times t. And then v final is equal to v initial plus a t. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve for t. So v final minus v initial over a is equal to t. And I'm going to substitute this back in. Delta x is equal to v initial times v final minus v initial over a plus a over 2 v final minus v initial over a all squared. So this becomes v initial v final minus v i squared over a plus v final squared minus v initial squared plus v initial squared minus 2 v f v i um, over 2 a. Let's make these denominators match. And so you stick them together and they become Let's see, this one cancels out with that one. And then there's some partial cancellation. So it's vf squared minus vi squared over 2a is equal to delta x. So delta x times a is equal to 1 half vf squared minus vi squared. And so this is delta x times f over m 1 half vf squared minus 1 half vi squared. And so delta x times f is equal to 1 half mvf squared minus 1 half mvi squared, which is equal to the change in the kinetic energy. How many more questions are there? Oh, God. Bend of the robot is floating in deep space. Does it matter what his velocity has? No, it doesn't. His velocity is zero. He decides he wants to throw his head towards home. First, he throws his right arm. Initial velocity is equal to zero. Um, first, he throws his right arm. So he throws it with final velocity, blah. And then he throws his left arm. And it has velocity, blah. Okay. So um, <clears throat> the total momentum is equal to zero i hat plus zero j hat. And it's going to be equal to the momentum of the torso plus the momentum of the arm. So um, 82 vx, so the i hat terms, the j hat terms, 82 plus 72 minus 288 and the y hat 82 v y plus 36 minus 144 v x v y <clears throat> 288 minus 72 divided by 82 is 2.63 meters per second and 144 1.32 meters per second. How much source energy does he expend when he throws his left arm? Oh God. Oh. Okay. I'm getting tired. I've been at this for two and a half hours. Uh, you guys can do these questions. Uh, all right, all right, all right. Let's just keep trucking. We're almost done. Ugh, gross. How much source energy does he use? All right, so we need to know the... Um, <clears throat> Uh, 
Okay, so the kinetic energy initially is zero. Um, and the kinetic energy after he threw his arm is going to be one half times the mass of his torso plus his head, which is 94, 94 kilograms. Um, Vx squared plus Vy squared, I don't know what those are, plus one half times the mass of his arm times uh, its velocity. And I do know its velocity. It's 12 squared plus 6 squared. So I need to figure out what these two are. And I got to do it using uh, momentum. So the nice thing about this is that you know exactly how much momentum the arm has. And so you know that the, oops, you know that the momentum of the arm is equal to the minus the momentum of the torso plus the head. Okay, so um, <clears throat> p torso head is equal to 94 vx which is equal to minus 72. Oh, geez, hold on. These are vectors. I hat plus 94 VY J hat. That's equal to 72 I hat plus 36 J hat with minus signs in front of them. VX is equal to 72 divided by 94. And 36 divided by 94. 0 0.383 meters per second, meters per second. So I can find the ki final kinetic energy. It's going to be 0.765 times 0.765 plus 0.383 574 joules so he used this much joules used this much source energy. Uh, the trick here is that um, he's not just going to put kinetic energy into his arm because the angular mo uh, because of the conservation of momentum. He also has to give his torso some kinetic energy. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, <clears throat> We know the initial velocity of his torso, right? So we can calculate the initial kinetic energy of his torso and head, which is 1 half 94 0 0.765 all squared plus 0 0.383 all squared. These are supposed to have minus signs on them, but it doesn't matter because we squared them. 0.765 times 0.765 plus 0.383 times 0.383 times 94 divided by 2. So there's 34.4 joules of energy initially in the system. And we know how fast it's moving. So his headless torso has mass 82 and is traveling with velocity 2.63. One half, uh, his melon has mass 12. And uh, velocity 24 squared plus 12 squared.
so uh, his final kinetic energy is Wah. Um, so how much energy does it take? It takes four, six, four, zero joules of energy to throw his head. Okay. Throwing of his left arm and throwing his head both take 0 0.2 to 10 seconds. Uh, which one required more average force? So the deal here is I need to figure out the impulse on his arm and the impulse on his head. <clears throat> Change in momentum. These questions are a lot easier when you have two pages in front of you to look at your answers. Gosh, okay, so his arm. His arm started with initial velocity zero uh, and final velocity 12 and six. Oops. Um, so the impulse is plus 12 I hat plus six J hat and its mass is six. So it's six times 12, 72 I hat plus 36 J hat. <clears throat> all right, what about this 12? All right, what's the final velocity of the head? Final velocity is minus 12 minus, tw minus 24 minus 12, right? What's its initial velocity? Its initial velocity is minus 0 0.765 minus 0.383. And we put it all together. It doesn't say which way. Oh, jeez. Um, okay, so in this question, I probably drew the information, and I didn't draw the information in this. So what are we gonna do? Um, I guess I guess we'll go like this. Let's say that it's blowing her this way. Um, Twenty degrees. Um, Okay, how much work is done by gravity by the time she goes to the bottom of the hill? And the hill's 100 meters long. And gravity's like this. It's uh, 9.81 times 80. So it's 785 newtons. And this angle here is gonna be 75 degrees. So the work is 100 times 785 times cosine of 75 degrees, which is 20317 joules. How much time, how much work is done by friction? They're in opposite directions, so the work is going to be minus. 80 times 100, 80, you know, that's minus 8,000 joules <clears throat> by the wind. All right, so this one's kind of bonkers. Um, so according to the diagram that I drew, the wind is like this to the horizontal. 
So that's uh, 20 degrees. And the slope here is 15 degrees. Right? And that means this angle between them is 5 degrees. So the wind force is, oh, geez, come on, 20 newtons. <clears throat> and the distance traveled, 100, cosine 5. So the work done here is 20 times 100 times cosine of 5. 1992 joules. I think when we originally did it, the, the wind was blowing her uphill, but whatever. All right, kinetic energy initial. It's going to be 1 half times her mass, which is 80. Hmm. Nancy's heavy. Times 2 squared. So that's 160 joules. Ke final is the initial kinetic energy plus all the work done. One sixty plus two oh three one seven plus one nine nine two minus eight thousand one four four six nine one half eighty v squared so v is equal to that times two divided by eighty square root answer nineteen point oh meters per second which is way too fast. And also, I'm tired and doing this thing for almost, well, almost three hours. All right. So that's all the office hours I'm doing. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.